and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where the glow from last weekend's amazing box office is still, still hanging around. We're still basking in that glow, but it's fading a little bit. Uh, I think the drops this weekend were probably more than Hollywood was hoping for, but I think they're not so bad that Hollywood isn't still holding its breath and crossing its fingers that this overall upward trend will hold. I think we haven't lost any ground, but we're not continuing to gain ground. Let's, let's break it down. The good news is, is that it, in just its second weekend, A Quiet Place 2 is racing to become the biggest domestic hit of the pandemic. Couldn't happen to a nicer movie or nicer creatives. And likely, it'll be, the, it'll be the first pandemic movie to hit the century mark domestically, again domestically, which has long been the arbiter of success for a Hollywood flick. It's got to hit that century mark, uh, as we often discuss. Uh, the sequel took a much bigger hit in its round two than the first film did. But that, and that film, by the way, broke the century mark in its second weekend, proving that the box office, as I said, is still not totally back up on its feet. And the international box office, well, it's quite frankly still lying down. But A Quiet Place 2 is doing the best it can overseas and still has a lot of markets to go. It's just getting started over there. China continues to be the brightest box office spot overseas, where A Quiet Place 2 is up to $29 million and is expected to match the first film's haul there. Cruella was very excited to get a Chinese release date, um, but it's not doing so great. It debuted in fourth place. Uh, and doesn't seem to be connecting with that audience. While uh, F9 has burned brightly but quickly in the Middle Kingdom, suffering huge drops weekend to weekend, but is expected to pass the checkered flag over there on par with Hobbs and Shaw. Now, since Vin Diesel and Dwayne Johnson are fighting for control of the uni franchise's future, F9 must beat out Hobbs and Shaw's global haul of 7.59. That's the number to beat. I mean, it has to at least come close because it is still a pandemic. Uh, but I, don't, I think Vin Diesel could use that excuse, but Dwayne Johnson will lord it over him and with the execs at Universal if Vin Diesel can't match or, or beat that number. Uh, with the, will A Quiet Place 2, Cruella, The Conjuring 3, and other films pave the box office road for F9, which will be hitting the rest of the world in mid to late June? Maybe, maybe, as I said. You know, the glow's still there. Uh, uh, the Conjuring 3 opened with 24 million, despite being on HBO Max day and date. Uh, that's one of the weakest openings for a Conjuring movie, but again, not bad for a pandemic uh, with a no extra cost digital option, again, day and date. It's on par with Mortal Kombat from earlier this year, which had the same HBO Max situation, and a tad better than Cruella's opening, which was 30 bucks a pop over on Disney Plus. And Cruella's getting a sequel, maybe. Where is Aladdin 2, for instance? That was announced that they were working on that as well, but we haven't heard a peep about it since. Uh, and they've been doing nothing but write, write during, uh, writing has been a big thing during the pandemic. They could have easily focused on Aladdin 2 and be gearing up to go into production. So I am suspicious. I definitely think they'll keep making Conjuring movies, by the way, though, because horror is dirt cheap to make. I mean, this movie, for instance, just cost 39 million. Now, as for Cruella, I think, I suspect there's some chance that Disney announced Cruella 2 to try and drive box office. When did they announce it? Friday night. They might've been looking at their Friday afternoon numbers and been like, we need to goose this. We need to make people feel like this is a con, we have to keep the conversation going. We have to get people who are on the fence to say, oh, I should go see this movie because this is a franchise with a future. I think that's why they might've done it on Friday. If I think if the numbers had been really strong, they would have announced Cruella 2 early in the week off of the box office. But I think the timing of when they announced it and they just said, we're developing it. We suspect to have the same people involved. I mean, when they date the movie or start adding new cast members and signing them, then we can feel it's really gonna happen. On that note, Paramount has dated A Quiet Place 3. It's happening for March 31st, 2023, which means they don't have quite the same faith in the third outing without John Krasinski behind the camera. He'll be producing, but he's no longer writing, directing. He's passed that baton to Jeff Nichols, who's never made a commercially successful film in his life. But hey, you never know, you never know. He's certainly made films that are highly regarded. Uh, and also I think this non-holiday weekend date that makes me suspect Emily Blunt might not be back either. They might focus just on the two children or uh, maybe a whole new family. We'll see what they decide to do. 
Uh, would The Conjuring 3, back to The Conjuring 3, would that have done better if it wasn't going up against another horror movie like A Quiet Place 2? Uh, I think A Quiet Place 2 doesn't have really a horror movie feel. I feel it has that Spielbergian thriller element to it, as I said in my coverage. I think that The Conjuring 3's lower box office is simply due to the HBO Max play. Now, demographic-wise, once again, Hispanic audiences really love horror films. I mean, that's, that's very strong support. Yet Hollywood, Hollywood knows this and has tried twice with both Paranormal Activity and The Conjuring films to make a film that's aimed directly at that demographic, but neither of those films succeeded. I'm curious, I'm curious why they can't make that work. Um, if, uh, if you're a Hispanic fan of horror films, what do you think it would take for a, film t a horror film targeted at your demographic to connect? Because those two did not. Uh, speaking of the Hispanic market, this coming weekend will be a big test as In, the, as In the Heights hits theaters, although of course it will have a day and date HBO Max play as well. And we'll get to see how Lin-Manuel Miranda at his most potent does at the box office, because of course Disney Plus put him straight to streaming. If the movie is an explosion of cash for Warner Brothers, I'm more curious how the film is uh, pre-booking in your area. In New York, ticket sales are incredibly strong. Incredibly strong. It's going to be a party. Uh, if you're in the New York area, you might definitely want to check it out in theaters. So if it does really well for Warner Brothers, Disney perhaps will green like that film adaptation of Hamilton rather than just the film theatrical version that they did put on Disney+, Plus, which was a huge hit for them. And I enjoyed it, but I would like to see a truly filmed version, uh, a film adaptation of, of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Now, Hamilton, of course, had very broad appeal, and In the Heights will need the same broad appeal to be a, a box office juggernaut. But the Hispanic demographic will be its foundation and driving force. So I'm very curious to see that, those box office numbers next weekend. Do you have tickets for it already? I'm curious. And are you seeing it in a premium format? Warner Brothers is really trying to get people to go to the theater for that. Uh, as, okay, so let's chart it up. For the week of May 3rd, again, remember Nielsen is behind. As we discussed late last week when talking about the cancellation of Jupiter's Legacy, it did debut at number one. And it, even, it was, as I just said, just can it canceled anyway. And it's interesting because Invincible is getting a season two and a season three, but it already fell out of the top 10 the week after it wrapped. It's only been in the top 10. It had um, like, like eight episodes, eight to 10 episodes, only made it in the top 10 twice. Uh, and it's gone already, although it's also a much less expensive show because it's animated instead of live action. But it just goes to show you, streaming continues to be quite the conundrum when it comes to business de decisions. Uh, the Handmaid's Tale is still uh, a strong brand for Hulu, as you can see, it in, in second place. Even if it doesn't get the same online and media chatter that it once did, people are still watching it. Well, Disney Plus has two shows in the top 10. Star Wars The Bad Batch, which debuted this week with two episodes, one on May the 4th, which was 70 minutes long. Remember, Nielsen is driven by Minutes Watched. And then also on Friday, they had a second episode um, come out as well. But it's good that, the, you know, no one talks about The Bad Batch either, but at least they're watching it, at least in its, its debut week. We'll see how it does in its second weekend when it no longer has Star Wars data to, to help propel it. And Falcon and Winter Soldier is showing a very strong hold, still in the top 10, now two weeks after its final episode. Uh, with movies, Mitchell's vs. the Machines and, and Without Remorse swapped the number one and two spots the week after they both debuted, but are still both holding the top two. This week on Netflix, Sweet Tooth debuted at number one, we all know that nece doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get a second season anymore. So we'll see. I mean, Shadow and Bone, as you saw from the Nielsen, was still holding strong. And where is its season two announcement? Nowhere. That's where. And Betty Broderick, we love to see it, is a huge hit on Netflix, cl clearly reaching a much bigger audience than it did originally on the USA Network last year when it originally aired. Hopefully, Amanda Peet's agent can use this to get her more work. This is the best thing she's ever done. It made me a huge Amanda Peet fan. Because she, she's just so good in this show. And I think, tragically, she has absolutely nothing on deck. So she's available. And over on iTunes, The Courier, great movie, is available for just $15, uh, $15 to purchase. And that got, it back to, that got it up to number one, where I don't believe it ever has been. Well, Spiral hit PVOD June 1st on Tuesday for a $20 rental and is doing moderate business. Uh, and Tom and Jerry is available to rent for just $6, which brought it into the top 10.
As for this coming week, Loki starts on Wednesday. I'm so curious to see what the 3 a.m. drop is going to look like in the middle of the week. What, what will happen? Oh, we're going to find out. But we're coming off of a month dry spell of Marvel content, and it's really going to be great to be back. Be sure to watch along with me at 3 a.m. live uh, on Wednesday morning, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'm going to do the full coverage, breakdowns. We're going to have a great time. On Thursday, the Infinite movie drops on Paramount+. Plus. Remember, that was supposed to originally be on theaters, and now it's exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. And on Friday, the entire season two of Love, Victor drops on Hulu, while Lupin Part 2 drops on Netflix. Then in theaters, In the Heights, right, opens on Friday, as well as will be available on HBO Max, while Peter Rabbit 2 is exclusive to theaters from Sony. And that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now. 